We can only trust what God says he's doing. We all know from a thousand experiences that our feelings are unreliable reporters. Be quick to listen, slow to correct, and take ear. These texts are also remind us that godly people sometimes feel and express these intense emotions, and often when they need what they need from us, in that moment is not an immediate remedial theological course. What they need is a fellow groaner who will sit in silence with them, and when it's helpful, point them to the empathetic saints of Scripture who felt similar things and found God faithful after all. So you and your loved ones <coughs> suffering may be inscrutable today, but in reality it's preparing me for them an eternal way of glory beyond all comparison. We take and part and hold on. If God feels cool today, you will discover someday that it was a pain-induced mirage and that the, he had graces planned for your life for your joy beyond anything you've ever been possible. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for all the wonderful miracles that we've seen in our life. And Father, we thank you for the close walk that we've felt with you. We thank you for reminding us this morning, Lord God, that even in those times when it seems you're so distant, but you're not really distant at all. You're right there just like you said you were. Help us to be strengthened as you strengthen us. Lord God, help us to remember, no matter what we're going through. But we too, like Job, want to put Satan to shame. And we want to lift up the name of Jesus amongst us. In our prayers and in our life's living, we want to be Jesus truly today with skin on in the good times and the bad. May you strengthen our church family throughout these holiday seasons. And Lord God, may we keep focused upon who you really are. And may we remember, no matter what the future holds, you're right here with us. We trust you. What an awesome place to be in your arms. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let us declare that we overcome through the blood of the Lamb by the word of our testimony. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all.
Therefore make any three requests of God, and He will be pleased to give them to you. Now think about that for a minute. How would you like if an angel of the Lord came to you and said, you found favor with God, and God's willing to grant any three things you ask for? So you got to think of the Geico commercial now. And I'm sure there's one out there about a genius literally he, he, liter about his gifts. Guy says, you know, what did you wish? I want a million bucks, and all of a sudden a million deer appear. <laughs> but just think about it. God given, do it to say that any three requests you ask from God, He will be pleased to give them to you. That's what you're saying. With, with all this, with all the blessings of God, with His goodness, and how He just wants to part of things, He's pleased to do that. He's blessed and pleased to do that. But He says there's only one condition. There's one condition that goes with it. This is like it's always a thing with God. Sometimes there's a condition that comes with it. But listen, condition. There's only one condition. Your neighbor, your neighbor will get a double portion of everything that is given to you. The farmer was so startled by all of this that he woke up his wife and told her all about it. She insisted that they put it to the test, just like a woman. No. <laughs> she insisted they put it to the test. So they prayed, Oh, blessed God, if you would just have, if we could just have a herd of a thousand cattle, that would enable us to break out of the poverty in which we lived in for generations. That would be wonderful. No sooner had they said these words than they heard the sound of animal noises outside. Lo and behold, all around the house were a thousand magnificent cattle. During the next two days, the farmer's feet hardly touched the ground. He divided his time between praising God for his great generosity and making practical, practical provisions for his newly found affluence. On the third afternoon, he was up on a hill behind his house trying to decide where to build a new barn when, for the first time, he looked across at his neighbor's field. And there on the green hillside stood 2,000 magnificent cattle. For the first time since the angel of the Lord had appeared, his joy evaporated and a scowl of envy took its place. He went home that evening in a foul mood, refused to eat supper, and went to bed in an absolute rage. He couldn't fall asleep because every time he closed his eyes, all he could see were his neighbor's 2,000 head of cattle. Deep in the night, however, he remembered that the angel had said that he could make three wishes. With that, he shifted his focus away from his neighbor and back to his own situation. And the old joy quickly returned. Digging into his heart to find out what else he wanted, he began to realize that in, that in addition to some kind of material security, he had always wanted descendants to carry on his name into history. So he prayed a second time, saying, Gracious God, if it please thee, give me a child that I may have descendants. It wasn't long before his wife came to him with the news that she was bearing in her body a life, not her own. In other words, she was pregnant. The next months were passed in unbroken joy. The farmer was busy with his newly acquired affluence and looking forward to the great grace of becoming a parent. On the night his first child was born, he was absolutely overjoyed. The next day was the Sabbath. He went to the synagogue, and at the time of prayers of the people, he stood up and shared with the gathered community his great good fortune. 
Now at last a child has been born into their home. He had hardly sat down, however, when his neighbor got up. God had indeed been gracious to our little community. I had twin sons born last night. Thanks be to God. On hearing that, the farmer went home in an utterly different mood than the one in which he came. Instead of being joyful, he was filled with the canker of jealousy. This time, the dark emotions did not go away. Late that evening, he made his third request of God, which was, Lord, please gouge out my right eye. No sooner had he said these words than the angel of the Lord who started the whole process came again. Why, son of Abraham, have you turned to such dark desirings? With pent up rage, the farmer replied, I can't stand to see my neighbor prosper. I'll gladly sacrifice half my vision for the satisfaction of knowing he'll never be able to look on what he has. Those words were followed by a long silence. And as the farmer looked, he saw tears forming in the eyes of the angel. Why, O oh son of Abraham, have you turned the occasion to bless and to a time of hurting? Your third request won't be granted, not because the Lord lacks integrity, but because he is full of mercy. However, know this, O oh foolish one. You brought sadness not only to yourself, but to the very heart of God. So what's the moral to this story? Why, Pastor, are you telling us this? Why would you read this story to us? If you want to be miserable, compare what you have with what other people have. There will always be someone with more than you, and there are always, and they will always be, in your opinion anyway, less deserving. See, Jesus, he told a similar story in Matthew chapter 20 about a vineyard owner and, and a few workers who grew resentful of those who had received equal pay for less work. How many of you have been there? Receive less pay. Receive equal pay for less work. Rather than being grateful for the good pay that they had been promised and had received, they were unhappy and critical of the vineyard owner for not giving them more. Here's what this story that Jesus tells. He says, For the kingdom of heaven, in verses 1 through 16 of Matthew 20, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went out to work in the vineyard at noon. And again at 3 o'clock, he came and did the same. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in the town again and saw some more people standing around. And he asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. And the landowner told them, go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the, with the last workers first. Then those hired at 5 o'clock were paid. Each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed that they would receive more. But they, too, were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, yet you paid them as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. Now, from a human standpoint, would you be upset? I know I'd be. I'd want to be ready to kick some butt. 
I'm speaking human, okay, from a human side. And he answered them, Fred, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I want. I wanted to pay this last worker. Um, the, sorry. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. See, Jesus wants us to truly keep the proper perspective about things. God desires for us to just realize that, that if we're being blessed, we need to what? Be satisfied with those blessings because one of the Ten Commandments simply says this, Thou shall not covet. See, see, to covet means to be jealous of what other people have. To envy those who have more. These negative emotions rob you of your happiness and keep you from praising God for what He has given. Giving you see when we get our eyes upon other people and other things and, and things we don't have, it's very easy to start to do what become jealous and become better. But what we need to understand, God is a good God. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, and we need to keep our eyes upon the blessings of what He's given us, so it does not rob us of our praise and the joy and the happiness that God desires for us to have. And again, if you compare yourself to those who have less, you may become proud. If you compare yourself to those who have more, you will probably become resentful. See, God wants you to be content and grateful regardless of what you have. Only then can He give you more. When we truly have a proper perspective on Thanksgiving, on a proper perspective of being content with what God has done, then God can truly bless our lives. He can truly come in and, and do the work because whenever we're constantly trying to compare to God, why do they have this? And I know that's the wrong question. We need to make sure we stay in a heart and an attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12, Paul tells Timothy this. He says, Now godliness with Contentment is great gain. If you, again, now when I say this, I'm not telling you not to strive to do anything, not to strive to be anything. That, that is not what I'm saying this morning. If you want to truly want to learn the, the, the lesson of truly being able to, be, be thanks, to have thanksgiving and joy in your heart, this word here is key. When you realize, and you simply say, now godliness with contentment is great gain. When we just simply say, Lord, as long as you're with me, <coughs> as long as I have you, that's good. What was the song we just sang just a little while ago? Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And folks, that's what our relationship with him needs to be like. It doesn't need to be about, I mean, granted, I'm, I'm glad God does, it, we, we live in the blessed, most blessed nation in the world. And I'm glad God does bless His people. I mean, because, you know, I can tell you, you know, um, there, there was one message I did years ago, and I talked about how I brought in some things. I, I, know, I brought in a toothbrush, and how many times we take, like, a toothbrush for granted. And, and you know, there's places in this world where people don't even have a toothbrush. If they do, they have one that the whole family has to use. You know, and, and we just take those blessings for granted. We, we take for granted the shoes that we have on our feet. The clothes that we have on our back. And all we do is say, well, God, why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? And instead of just being content in where we are in Him, knowing that His goodness and His blessing and His mercy is upon us. Right? I, I mean, it's hard to go without. But Paul here, he tells Timothy, he says, but now God in this, with content and this great gain, he says, there's great treasure, there's great Joy and being content where God has you. Because we often know that, what does Romans 8, 28 say? We know that all things, we know that all things, we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. No matter what situation you're in right now, no matter what the circumstance may be, if you truly keep your eyes upon Him, God is working it all out for your good. Yeah, that's 
right. Sometimes when it's wicked and patient in those states, we begin to have our own little <coughs> pity party. But Paul, he's saying, now the college with contentment is great gain. Because here's what he says. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. All the possessions you acquire in this life, guess what? When you die, or when the rapture takes place and we go to heaven, they're not going to be yours anymore. Somebody else, whether it's a relative, the government, or whoever, is going to take hold of them. And they're going to be having them, using them, maybe enjoying them, maybe not. Maybe they'll burn it to the ground. Because they don't like it. I don't know. But you're not going to be able to take it with you. He says, in having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. That this is one of the, the biggest things that has robbed the American church of its joy, of its power, and of its love. Because all we hear, and, and, and again, I know in the God and His Word, he, he talks about, you know, if we pay our tithe and our offerings, how we pour out a blessing upon us, all you hear on Christian television, which that's why most of the time there's only certain guys I listen to, because other guys, I just, if, if I had the ability to put my fist through the TV and hit them in the mouth, that's what I would do. Amen. And I, I'm not playing. I, I'm sick, you know, I, will, I believe in prosperity. God will prosper His people. But folks, it's not about money all the time. It's not about giving you a, a, a mansion down here on earth. It's not so you can have seven cars in your garage and you can have five pools and a vacation home and, 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 and a summer home, a winter home, and a home that you live in. It's not about that. Because I have, again, I don't, I don't, I don't begrudge anybody for doing well and doing things. But the thing is, I don't understand why in the world a so-called prophet of God needs to have three homes that are worth $30 million and all this stuff, instead of putting that money into ministry, trying to reach people for Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Amen. Like I said, I, I don't begrudge God for blessing people, but sometimes they can go to the excess. It's not about the money. It's not always about money, but it's truly of getting to a place well, we're content that God just meets our needs. I heard one minister a while back, he said, you know, he said, there's some church, all they teach is, you know, you got to be a little Christian. That's not what I'm preaching either. I want you to really understand what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not telling you that God wants you to be poor, because that's not Him. Because His Bible declares blessing and prosperity upon His children. I believe that we have those, the promises that God gave the, the nation of Israel because we are engrafted into that olive tree to that root that is Jesus Christ that we are the wild branches brought in as we read that Paul talks about I believe that the promises he gave to Abraham those promises are extended up because we are the children of Abraham because we are the children of faith and the Bible declares that the children of faith are the true children of Abraham so we are to the blessings that were given to Abraham are given us he wants to bless those who bless us and he wants to curse those who curse us. He wants to pour out his blessings upon us. But it's not about the blessings. It's about us knowing that our fulfillment is found in him and in him alone. Amen. And yet all we do, we worry about these things, that things, and all this stuff. And we need to get away from that. Having food and clothing with these we shall be content. Now listen to what he says. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Not only a temptation, but what? A snare. What have I told you about temptation? What is temptation designed? What is temptation always designed to do? Temptation is always designed to do what? To draw you away from God. Temptation, period, I don't care what the temptation is. Temptation is always designed to draw you away from God. Remember, I said temptation is different than trials and testing. Temptation is always desired to draw you away. Trials, tribulation, 
Testing is always designed to do what? To pull you closer to Him. So there's a difference. That's how you can tell which one it comes from. God will never do anything to do what? Push you away. He not say hurt you. Because Job went through a lot. He allowed things to happen. But whatever God does in your life, it is always designed, it is always designed to draw you closer to Him. Whatever the devil does in your life is always purposed to draw you away. But those who want these things fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, am I telling you it's wrong to have money or possessions? No, I am not. But listen to what he says in verse ten: For the love of money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil why are we dealing with human trafficking and human sex slaves today it, yes it comes to the perverseness of mankind the, 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 the depravity of the human nature but it all truly revolves around one thing. The Almighty God. Have <clears throat> you ever seen the movie Taken? Yeah. With Liam Neeson? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you see it, watch it on TV. Do not watch it on video. I didn't watch it on video. Don't want to watch it on video for this. I'm sure it has way too much language and everything else. So if you ever watch it, watch it on TV. But 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 at the end of get towards the end of the movie. His daughter gets taken, and, she, and she's sold into basically human trafficking. And she now, he gets to where she is, finally, and just when he thinks that, that you know, he, he's going to lose, he gets free, and he, and he gets this guy, and he, find, he wants to find out where he is, and the guy looks at him and says, it's nothing personal, it's only business. We need to be careful that we never develop that kind of attitude as a Christian. That whether we're on our job, if we're in a business, working for somebody, to where we try to justify unethical, unmoral, unchristian things by simply saying, Lord, it's nothing personal. In other words, Lord, I'm not doing this. My, my Christian part isn't doing this. It's just business. Yeah. Is that For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that pursuit, as he says here, will pierce you with many sorrows. It will cause you to stray from the faith. Well, listen to what he says in verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and had confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Oh, Jesus, forget about the pursuit of money. Don't let that be your main goal because here's the thing. If, if you remember, if you go back to what God was telling the children of Israel, He told them in Deuteronomy 28, if, you, if you've never read this chapter, you need to read it. But he starts it off saying, if you pursue me with all of your heart, in other words, it means when we, do our, when we make God our main focus, when we, when we make sure that it's truly all about Him, it's all about following Him, it's all about serving Him, it's all about obeying Him, then He begins to list the blessings that literally not only come upon the children of Israel, but as the King James declares, that will literally overtake them. Literally, it's sort of like a rushing flood coming in from behind them. It will literally pursue them, overtake them, and envelop them. And it's not their pursuit of the blessings. 
It's their pursuit of the blesser. <coughs> Having your mind truly in the right place of thanksgiving, going to this Christmas, we need to understand it's about the blesser. It's about the giver. It's about him. And if we truly keep our eyes upon that, we will truly have a heart of thanksgiving we're supposed to have. We'll truly have the joy of Christmas that we're supposed to have because we have our minds focused in the right way. It's not about these earthly things, but it's about Him. And then when we truly get focused that way, then it frees Him up to truly bless us with things in this life, to truly fulfill His Word and the blessings He's talked about in His Word. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul tells the church of Thessalonica, he says, in everything, give thanks. When we heard this parable, see, too many times, see, we, we would sit there, most of us would say, well, I wouldn't be like that neighbor. You, would, you don't know until you're in that situation. Because if the, the enemy, if the enemy can get a foothold into something he calls where God wants to bless you into becoming a curse and a hindrance in your life, that's what he'll do. That's why you need to be careful. When you're pursuing him, all of a sudden, when these blessings overcome, do, do not become like the world. and Don't get focused on it. You've got to constantly keep your eyes upon the blesser. You've got to constantly keep your eyes upon the giver. Because when we get our eyes off of him, that's when we will find ourselves in trouble. So in all these situations, we have to be ready to give thanks to Him, for this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Like I said, we must always keep an attitude of thanks towards God, be encouraged by these following verses. We always got to do this. There's going to be a couple of verses I'm going to read to you to close out the message today. Let's say we just come off the hills of Thanksgiving. We're entering into what is called the, the most wonderful it's the most wonderful time of the year. And why is that? Because one name, because it's a time when we remember the coming of one name, Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth. The Savior of the world. Emmanuel, God with us. For the angels declare glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Good will toward men. See, that all came with this one name, <coughs> Jesus. So we have a reason to celebrate. We have a reason to rejoice because the Savior has come. The Savior has been born. And His name is Jesus. So we can have thanksgiving. We can have joy. We can Go through this season with an uplifted heart. See, don't let the enemy come in and rob you of your blessings. That's why we dealt with the whole baggage thing of getting rid of it, of destroying it. If you put it up here, you need to make sure that's where it stays. Burnt, and I, I burnt all, I made sure all that stuff was completely burnt in that bucket. I may have tried to asphyxiate you last Sunday. And I couldn't... Get it all burnt while it was in here, but when service was over, I made sure it was all burnt up. In fact, is I kept on relighting it until it wouldn't light anymore yeah. because it was so much ash. Don't let the enemy come in and lay back on you what you have given over to God. Because, again, He has given you the victory. Jesus Christ is the victorious one. And we need to make sure, if there's been any time before, in any time in history, we need to make sure we're walking in the freedom and the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ in this day in which we are living in now. And the best way to do that is with a joyous heart. With an attitude of thanks towards God. Being content. Looking at the blessing, looking at the giver more than everybody else around us. Because here's what we read in some of the Psalms. <coughs> and these are just Psalms of praise. Psalms 100 says, 
Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. We're to serve with gladness. We're to be joyful. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is for the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. Come on, church. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endures to all generations. The Lord is good. good. Never, ever forget that. No matter what you're going through, no matter what the struggle, no matter what the problem may be, the Lord is good. Good. Psalms 107, verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. He's good. His mercy endures forever. Psalms 107, verse 8 says, All oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. He is good. And for His wonderful works to the children of men. And what we ended the service, what we talked about last week in service, what we ended last night with in our praise and worship time together, and what I'm going to end this message with this morning. Psalms 103, 1 and 2. You want the proper key for living a successful life, living a successful Christian life. Again, it's keeping your eyes on the giver, on the blessing. And it says, let all that I am praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise His holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things or the benefits He does for me. Let us never take for granted the goodness of the Lord. Even if it may be like or like Job and everything he went through and the prayer that he prayed, God was still on the scene. He was still working because the Bible declares that the, last, the latter part of Job, the end of Job's life, that God blessed him double than what he had before. And Job was the wealthiest man in the land before God ever sent the initial, for God allowed the, the, the initial uh, trial and tribulation to come. But because in, in all of that, Job still did not misspeak truly to God. He didn't understand. He, well, he couldn't understand what was going on because he knew how his heart felt towards God. He knew how he loved God. And, and in his mind, why is this happening? And all the while, it was God showing, showing the devil, and plus showing us in future time, what God will do when we keep our eyes upon the blessing and the giver. Instead of our circumstance. Because the same man that said the one stuff there, he also said earlier, though he slay me. You've said this a lot over this last little while, you have. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Because we must understand that God is good. He has our best interests at heart. But we need to get to a point where we need to understand, God, what you do, another thing for me. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to look to you. Because when, when we truly get to a point where it's all about Him, it's all about Him, it frees Him up to do what He promised in His Word He would do for the children of faith, for the children of Abraham. So I'm going to encourage you throughout, through the end of this Thanksgiving, keep on having an attitude of what? Gratitude and thanksgiving. And enter into this Christmas season with joy in your heart, knowing that God is good. He has your best interest at heart. Forget about everybody else. And just look to Him. And let Him do in your life what He desires to do. Amen.
and I'm asking our musicians to come. But, the, but how to get where we need to go, we find in this song. And as we sing this song this morning, of what I've talked about this morning, if you want to truly have that contentment, if you want to truly have that joy, that peace, as we sing this song, let this song be your prayer. Come up singing as you come. Because again, remember, sometimes I tell you, the purpose of the altar and the action come up, it's a matter of what? Stepping out in faith. It's, it's that outward sign of obedience to God. You say, Lord, I heard your word today, and I want it to be applicable in my life. I want it to apply it to me. I want to grab a hold of it. I want to be living and thriving in my life. And this is just an outward. Yes, you can do it back there. But, but there's something about when you when you truly step out of faith, when, when, when the man of God says, do this, and in obedience, see, that, that's a dirty word for a lot of people. In obedience, you do it. So if God is speaking to your heart today, He's speaking to your life, I would encourage you to step out in faith. Saying, Lord, I'm going to keep my eyes upon you. I'm going to keep a proper perspective on Thanksgiving, a proper perspective going into this Christmas season with joy like never before going. I want you to stir up that joy. I want you to stir up my heart. And I know that truly can only be found in you. But it comes to truly having a pure heart. A heart that's truly given completely and utterly over to him. Folks, I know what we're saying, but it's easy to talk. But it can be tough to live. But if you're truly seeking him, the Lord said, he will be found by you. So I'm going to encourage you. Oh, 